Well, you are in luck. This is the last lecture that you see of me. That's quite a relief, isn't it? And the, during the first hour, I'd like to summarize everything that we did. That's why I gave the table of contents. And effectively, what I shall do is to, again, write down the table of contents on the blackboards. But they are all printed for you, so you don't have to copy anything, take any notes. But remind ourselves what we did in each section, in what order, what came out, what was important, and how everything was used and fit together. And then, <clears throat> that's not going to take too long, I hope. And after the break, I'll show you something interesting. The course we had was called Topology and Geometry, but it could have also been called Pictorial Thinking. And in 2014, we started in the first chapter. Um, who was missing the table of contents? There were two people um, there and there. Thank you very much, Adrian. Yeah. We began with the catalog of most important manifolds. Remember, so this was the section on examples that were needed in order to build further examples. All the manifolds, all the geometric figures in the world can be built up by combining these in various ways. We had the ball, the sphere, or which is the boundary of that ball, dimension one fewer, the cube of dimension m. You can dissect such cubes, for example, by cutting and so on. And we also had tori, toras, plural, which is tori. T squared is the standard two-dimensional surface of a donut. Also, my initials, Tadashi Tokieda. And also, we had the famous Mubiu strip. It can be twisted any number of times. And cut it along the center, you get different results. Also, something called a climb bottle. You might remember. And the simplest way I find of drawing this is something like that. It's a, it's a bottle which joins up with itself, but in a funny sort of way. There was also the real projective plane. And by combining the tori, you had the real one surface of genus G that was orientable. And the non-orientable surfaces of genus G combining out the two, the projective planes. So we had all those things. And also we had operations of manifolds. What do we mean? Well, given those ingredients, basic manifolds, you could do some sort of calculation with them, or you could add, multiply, and so on, or take um, quotients, all that. You could take the boundary, for example, of the ball and get the sphere. The cube is homeomorphic to a ball, so if you take the boundary, you also get the sphere, although it has corners, but that's okay. Topologically, they're indistinguishable. All the others, uh, all the others not. Um, Taurus, Kleinbottle, RP2, these do not have any boundary. Movie strip does have, a, does have a boundary. If you have the standard movie strip which twists once, what is its boundary? It's not two circles, a single circle, which is quite interesting. OK, so you could take the boundary. You could also um, do the product, familiar operation from elementary mathematics, Cartesian, or direct product, as you know. And also, you take, can take a quotient, also known as identification space. You introduce a, an equivalence relation, and that's the quotient. And finally, a funny operation, or surgery, or connected sum, as you remember. And you can do all sorts of things with manifolds. 
So, having prepared the ground, having prepared a catalog of all the examples that we can have, we then discussed the idea of isotopy carefully. That's what we sometimes informally call deformation. Deforming something, you isotope something. And the key concept, this is not a standard piece of terminology in the mathematical world, so I put it between quotation marks, was overflow. Depending on how big your ambient space was, how many dimensions you had around you, freedom, two submanifolds may or may not intersect. And if you have an m-dimensional manifold and k-dimensional and l-dimensional submanifolds, whether they intersected or not, generically, depended on k plus l minus m. You see, k plus l is what you have to put in, and m is how much room there is. So that difference tells you how much overflow there is. If k plus l minus m is negative, that's OK. Um, there is a lot of room, so they don't all intersect. If they did, you can just shake the picture and detach them. That's the case in, for example, three-dimensional space, m is three, one-dimensional curve, one-dimensional curve. Well, they might very unlikely intersect, but usually they don't. Okay? One-dimensional curve and one-dimensional curve do not meet in three-dimensional space. The overflow is one plus one minus three, that's negative. But if the overflow is zero, think of the case two-dimensional surface and one-dimensional curve piercing along the surface in three-dimensional space. One plus two minus three is zero. That means that they meet in a zero-dimensional subspace. Zero-dimensional, that's point. And you cannot get rid of this intersection by perturbation. If you move, you get this zero intersection somewhere. Okay. And if the overflow is positive, think of the case when you have two surfaces of dimension two, dimension two and dimension two in dimension three. Well, two plus two minus three, that's one. There is an overflow of one dimension, which means that the, the intersection must be along a one-dimensional subspace. Okay, and etc. And when we discussed the moving or isotoping things, overflow became important, but you needed one more dim dimension, extra dimension, in order to uh, isotope things. So, overflow controls um, the dimension of intersection. That's what we learned. And then we had, of course, the idea of isotopy itself, and our notation, that's fairly standard notation, was this uh, twiddle. Okay, how do we use these concepts, the, all the catalog of basic manifolds and what you can do with them, together with the idea of deformation? Our entire theory was based on the concept of intersection number. This is the central concept of this course. If I may digress slightly, modern topology has developed in terms of something called homology and homotopy. Those are the two great currents of topology and really useful ways of looking at the world. Homology and homotopy, they are related. There is also dual concepts called cohomology and cohomotopy. But intersection number is really the easiest thing to calculate. And it is, in some sense, the baby model of homology theory and a little bit of homotopy. So that is why when I designed the course at Ames, I decided to base everything at intersection number because it does not need much preparation. As you saw, we found it fairly easy to think of what an intersection number was, a picture of intersection number, its properties, but as you also saw, it's powerful enough for most applications. So that's why we talked about intersection number. That's why we based the entire course on the concept of intersection number. The main idea was that you counted the number of crossings. But not all intersections are counted plus one. Some were counted plus one, some were counted minus one, depending on the orientation match or mismatch. So counting intersection points. 
with sines. Plus one, minus one, plus minus. And this unit between submanifolds whose overflow is exactly zero, so that those two submanifolds meet or intersect in points. You remember this, I hope. And then the key concept, really the central concept of this course, intersection number itself, which we denoted by this strange symbol, little circle. So K little circle L in that order. If you instead consider the L small circle K, L, K, you have to look after the sign change. Okay. And the Really important theorem. That was, I believe, theorem 17. You see, it's so important that I even remember the number. You don't have to. Theorem, which is the theoretical foundation for the entire course, and which is also easy to visualize, is that this intersection number is invariant under isotopes. In other words, when you deform the picture, this intersection number does not change. It is, a physicist would say, a conserved quantity, like energy and other things. But it is true that it, this intersection number is isotopy invariant only for closed submanifolds. Closed means compact without boundary. You recall that if you have boundaries, well, the intersection points can fall off the boundary or appear from the boundary, so you don't get this uh, <coughs> invariance. So that means without boundary. Whether the boundary of a sub manifold is empty or not, therefore, is very important. Okay? And also, we discuss, let me write Advan. As a, an immediate application, the generalization of what is called the Jordan curve theorem, which Taboka has seen. Um, the, in the two dimensional version, it says that if you have a closed loop which does not intersect itself, however complicated it is, that loop separates this entire plane into two components, interior and exterior. But we saw this using intersection theory for the generalized version, if you are in an m-dimensional Euclidean space and you draw an m-minus-one-dimensional hypersurface, which does not intersect itself, it does not cross itself, such a hypersurface separates this space into interior and exterior two components. So generalization of jordan curve theorem. This theorem is supposed to be extremely difficult to prove, but we saw, at least in our framework, how easy to do so, and that's entirely thanks to the way the theory is set up in a very pictorial fashion.